We ask you to turn off cell phones and stuff like that to avoid noise. Um, I guess we can begin. Uh, so I'm Simo Sotir, I work for Red Hat and about um, two years ago we started thinking about this project called Free IPA and we actually got to implement it. Um, so I guess the first question for everybody that doesn't know it already is what is Free IPA and what does it stand for? Um, so Free IPA stands for Free Identity Policy and Audit and those are the three legs that compose our product. The purpose of the project is to make simple to manage a complex problem and the problem is the problem of managing identity management and managing identities in an enterprise. Um, the means are try to use as much as possible uh, standard components, standard protocols, so that uh, it's easy to implement uh, uh, because you used uh, documented protocols and also it's easy to reuse already existing comp components and clients uh, in, your, in, in your organizations. And the target is system administration for seven to 100 years. And what we try to accomplish is to have uh, a system that is certainly complex, but also easy enough to use that you don't have to be an expert in every single component of the system. But the next question is, why should I care about something like that? Um, well, the point is that every organization that is not a very small organization, like anything that is more than 10 users, need to manage users and resources inside it. Um, so if you look at the IDM landscape, what you see is that so far, only proprietary software w was available for organizations that need to do some complex uh, identity management. Uh, of course, there, there have been for many years, 20 years and more, uh, single building blocks that were available, like MIT Kerberos, uh, various LDAP implementations like OpenLDAP and other LDAP servers, um, all kinds of web servers, uh, different kind of policy and auditing servers. But to be able to have a comprehensive and a complex system integrated, uh, you really had to be an expert in a, every single of these uh, components. And this kind of expertise is not that common. Uh, while there are probably many of you that really knows how to manage uh, one or many of these systems, being able to really manage them all in a way that uh, can be easily uh, applied to an organization that has uh, multiple uh, you know, uh, sites or multiple uh, administrators is not, is not easy. And indeed, uh, it wasn't, it, it, it's never uh, common. When I go to uh, enterprises, I find that I use um, various proprietary products for that reason. And they, they cannot trust uh, one or two administrators to bear the, the load of the whole organization, especially if it's very big. So they, they do things like using, if they, if, if they are kind of a window shop, today they tend to use AD, Active Directory, uh, they use NT4 domains or E directory before. Uh, if they've been a mostly Unix shop, they, they may still be using CA, A Trust all these kinds of products. And the problem is that um, these products basically hold the keys of your organization. They have the very uh, entry point. They have the user identity. They have the credentials. So basically is uh, a very effective um, method to lock you in into their, into their business. Um, so if you want to have a fully free environment, or without, you actually need also a free identity management system so that you can have not only your free servers, but also a complete free environment where you use them. Uh, and I, I believe a lot in security plus freedom. And by, by freedom, here I mean uh, free software, open source, you can inspect it. But also being able to switch to someone else if you are not satisfied by the security that your current security provider is provides you. When you have a closed uh, source 
solution, it's very difficult, it's extremely difficult actually, to try to move to some, something else. You're basically completely at the mercy of the, of the organization that provides you uh, that solution. Because uh, basically every single machine in your organization is tied to that solution, and try to change it on the fly is it's a very hard task. So <clears throat> let's try to dive in into what is the identity management problem. Um, what we faced when we start this project were, were basically more or less these needs. Uh, we needed a single source for identities uh, because uh, duplication is usually confusion. Uh, we came from uh, situation in many customers where people basically used to replicate the user from server to server to server and tried many ways to keep them synchronized, especially in, in, in the Linux space. Um, some organization used uh, NIS or NIS Plus. Very few used uh, LDAP. And the reason for not using this, um, this system were uh, depending mostly on the history of the organization, but some felt uh, that mm, having to depend on an external network services uh, was not uh, trustworthy enough at the time, or was too complex, or was too fragile. Um, the second problem, or the second need, is single sign-on or single password, which are two quite different things. By single sign-on, I mean you don't have to put your password anywhere. so you. You, you, uh, you can authenticate on your client machine and go and connect to any single machine in your organization without having to provide your credential anymore. While single password is um, you know, kind of second class or fallback position where at least you have the same password everywhere, but you still have to provide it on, on every server or on most of the service you connect to. Um, now, to achieve single source of identity and single sign-on or single password, uh, you also need a single data store for identity and reporting because you need to be sure that everything is working as you expect and you, have, you need to be able to report what's going on in your organization. Once you spread uh, uh, authentication or identity in, uh, on, on, in the whole organization, you need to be able to know that actually your machines are uh, in compliance with the organization policies that you know when you change a password somewhere the strength is, is, is controlled so that you don't uh, use a too uh, common password or that the machine that's actually inside of this network is uh, actually reapplying the policies that come down from your network. Um, and finally uh, you want a single point of management. You want to have a comprehensive view. You don't, want, uh, you don't want to have multiple systems you have to touch just to create a user identity. You don't want to go in one place to create a user and give it, uh, for example, your, its POSIX attributes like the user ID and group ID and stuff like that, and then go to another system to set the password, and maybe another system to set some other attributes of the user or preferences or the policies. You just want to go in one, one place so that you can see everything about the user in one uh, single comprehensive view. Um, so what are the implementation problems to achieve that? Um, so one problem is either synchronization or, or integration where when you have two distinct uh, components that need to be synchronized uh, in some organizations that want to use both Windows and, and Unix, for example, there's a problem synchronizing uh, the, the users on the Active Directory side with whatever you had in, in, on the Unix side. Um, another is distribution of data or credentials. Uh, when you have a system where you distribute or where you try to synchronize uh, users, you have also the problem of distributing uh, any change that comes in one of these systems so that the others uh, keep uh, being synchronized. Uh, you have single points of failures in some cases when you have a system that is not able to be to replicate, and you also have the problem again of um, integrating interfaces because you have different components that are completely uh, uh, use completely different interfaces. You have a fragment uh, system where you have to learn different syntaxes or different methods to change the information. So that's that's a challenge for for organizations. 
So <clears throat> let's see what are the free API components that we decide to use to try to solve these problems. So the first one is the directory, and by directory I mean LDAP. There are other directories like NIS and NIS Plus that I've been using in the past, but we found that um, they were not actually uh, able to do what we needed to do. Um, so why a directory? So we need a storage mechanism to keep the identities. Uh, these storage mechanisms need to be able to perform fine-grained access control. And why is that? If you look at uh, the classic Unix or Linux uh, authentic authentication methods, you see that uh, the data storage in the very basic configuration is the ATC password file and ATC shadow file, for example. So we have actually, even on a single client, two places where you have some information. And the reason is that the original mechanism, the ATC password, was not able to have fine-grained access control on each and every field of the, of the file. So when you know, a password attacks started to happen in the real world, people realized that having the password hash in the same file that everybody need to access to see all the other information was not a good idea because you were not able to prevent people to see from seeing the password hash. So the shadow fail file was created. Uh, at this point, we have uh, uh, already a synchronization problem. What happens if I change the password file and I forget to change the shadow file? Um, of course, there are tools to avoid that, but uh, that, that was, it was a problem. And that problem was also in NIS, because NIS is basically taking the file you had on your local machine and trying to distribute them again on, on multiple machines. But it didn't change how these files behaved. Um, so in, 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 in a system like LDAP instead, what happens is that you can set uh, access control instructions for each and every attribute. So you can say, if you log in as an administrator, you can see or you can change, usually you don't see it, the hashes for your password. But the user that comes in can only see other attributes like the shell, the home directory, don't, can't see the hashes of, of other users or, or his own hashes. Um, we also need to be able to organize identity and other group relationships. Uh, that's what, uh, wh why is that? Uh, again, if you look at the relational Linux system, you also have a third file, which is ATC group. ATC group contains group information. But again, there, we have a synchronization problem because you may create a user in ATC password E and not put it in the right group. So you may change groups and not, don't realize that the, the user doesn't, doesn't exist anymore in password E, et cetera. So, we, we, we wanted a system where, in a single tree, we could have both users and, group ident and groups, because groups are part of the identity of a user. Uh, a group may define what you have access to, uh, what machines you have access to, or what resources on the machine you have access to. So it's, it's really part of the identity. And if you look in the kernel, you see that actually the kernel have a structure where it is the user ID and the group IDs, and exactly for that reason, because group IDs are an integral part of your identity. Um, uh, another good point is that uh, we need to distribute information across the cl all clients, and LDAP is, is really good at that. L LDAP has, has been built exactly to distribute information uh, in, in, and can do that very efficiently. Uh, it's very efficient from sources. It's less efficient for writes, so when you make changes, it's a bit slower, but that, that, that's not important because the main, the main task for an LDAP server is to distribute information. And finally, and that's to avoid a single point of failure, um, you really need to be able to replicate information on multiple servers so that if your main server or your whatever server you usually use goes down, you can immediately connect from your client to another server and keep having information from the server. Um, other reasons why we chose, uh, we chose LDAP is that it, it's a standard, although uh, it's not a standard that can change, uh, and indeed, some implementations are less adherent to the standard that we would like, but more or less, uh, at least for all the basic functionality, LDAP is quite standardized, and uh, all the clients we know can connect to a random LDAP server without uh, problems. It's extensible, uh, both in the sense that you can extend the information that is tied to a, an identity user or a group, 
uh, you just have to introduce some, more, some new schema, attach a new object class to a user entry, and you can attach new information to that user entry. And unless uh, a client is very badly written, what happens is that the client doesn't mind if there is more information, because the way LDAP is done is that um, you, it's, it's really part of the protocol that you can find additional attributes they are not interested in. When a client search for some information, usually it doesn't only specify how to reach the entry, but also which attributes it is interested in. So that, that means that you can really extend uh, uh, the information about the user in the same place where all the other information is without having to create new I I information at the storage. Um, it's also extensible in, in the sense of what operations you can do in LDAP. Uh, LDAP has indeed extended operations. So basically, you can customize and create new operations over LDAP if you need something that cannot be simply solved with a query. Uh, and we actually do that in, 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 in Free IPA. And it's very flexible because of these reasons. So second part of, of the identity is usually authentication. They, are, they go together. You have an identity, you have some credentials. How do I use this credential to prove that I am who I am? And what we decide to use is Kerberos for a number of reasons. Okay. Um, so we say that one of the things we need to do when you use an identity management system is trying to provide single sign-on as much as possible. That allows you to provide services for a multitude of servers without having the user to re-enter his password again and again and again, which is something that is uh, both annoying for the user because he has to basically stop his, his work and try to remember his credentials and re-enter again. It's also usually insecure because if you, if you make the user think that it's normal to provide a, your password for anything you do, then it's very easy to convince him to provide the same password to a server that is not under your control, meaning that it's, it, make, it makes the user um, willing to give the credential even to servers that are not trusted, which is bad. Um, and Kerberos allows you to do single sign-on authentication. Kerberos is a ticket-based system where you basically contact, uh, at login time, a key distribution center that will give you back a, a ticket. And that ticket uh, basically allows you to get other tickets to access, to, to access services without having to provide your real credentials anymore. And the good thing is that this ticket is, uh, expires very quickly. Usually it's between 6, 8, 24 hours, depending on the configuration of the KDC. Which means, again, that even if someone can somehow get hold of your ticket, he's not able to use it for more than 8 hours, 24 hours, the time until the ticket expires. Because the, there is never transmission of your credentials which are required to basically acquire a new ticket gone and further use uh, other people's credentials. Um, uh, because of this, uh, it allows um, also administrators and users to basically go from server to server. And through delegation, it also allows you, if you use something like SSH, to basically get into a server, delegate your credentials to the server, and from the server, connect to another one, and still carry on your credentials. And you can delegate again, and again, and again, without having to directly connect to each service you need. So you basically can jump from server to server and carry on your credentials with you by just carrying your, your uh, ticket granted ticket. Um, it's a very test standard. has been uh, developed for many years at MIT and it has been actually implemented in basically all the uh, identity management system around there. Um, the most popular uh, system that basically made Kerberos available to everybody is actually Active Directory, which is based on Kerberos as well. And their implementation is almost standard. Uh, they have some things uh, added to it, but uh, it kind of interoperate with the standard MIT Kerberos implementation. Um, it is also, to some degree, extensible. Uh, it's not like LDAP where you can plug in whatever you want, uh, but there is a very active, still very active community around Kerberos, 
Uh, MIT also created recently the MIT Kerberos Consortium to be able to keep going on and develop uh, MIT Kerberos. Um, you can actually uh, introduce quite easily new encryption, encryption algorithms. Uh, recently, uh, AES was introduced in most Kerberos implementations, and this is going completely away. Uh, but it's, it's very easy to uh, introduce new encryption algorithm and, and the protocol is, is built so that it can actually um, provide the clients for, with a list of, of uh, encryption algorithms that are accepted from the server and vice versa so that basically clients and servers can uh, negotiate the, the best encryption algorithm available at any, at any given time. Um, so, we use Kerberos in, in, in free IPA. It's the predominant method to do authentication with, uh, when you use a free IPA, but uh, because um, uh, unfortunately many applications still rely on a username and password uh, paradigm, we also provide uh, the ability to use LDAP binds, classic LDAP binds, where you connect to LDAP, provide username and your password and you know, authenticate it. But this is uh, certainly what, not what we advise you to use normally. So back to the, to the components list. Um, up to this point seems very simple. Basically, there are just two components. Uh, you have the LDAP server and the Kerberos server. And it seems like it shouldn't be a big deal to build something like this, uh, but unfortunately, this is not all. As soon as you introduce Kerberos in an organization, you have to deal with DNS and NTP. Uh, one thing about Kerberos is that it's very time sensitive. Because Kerberos releases uh, tickets that are available only for a short period of time, it actually needs to make sure that you are not using clock skew to try to reuse an old ticket again. So the maximum clock skew between a client and, and the server can be five minutes. So there is, um, clients and server can have a slightly different notion of what exactly this moment is in time, but not too much. So what you really need in an organization is to introduce NTP, the network transfer protocol, so the network time protocol, so that all the client servers in your organization basically are synchronized uh, and they all share the same clock. The other, um, components um, that is not strictly necessary, but actually uh, for any real implementation uh, you really want it is DNS. Uh, the reason is that when you use Kerberos to connect to a service and you want to authenticate to that service, you need to know what is the uh, DNS domain name of that service. And that's because when you ask for a ticket, you need to ask the KDC for a ticket for a specific service name because the name is part of, of, the, uh, of the service principle, the, basically the identity of the service. So if you don't have a way, uh, basically, to connect to a server using a name, you can't uh, get the ticket to connect to that service unless you ask the user to provide it somehow, and that's something you don't want to do. So basically, it turns out that when you implement Kerberos, you want to have DNS and you want to have all the client and server registered in DNS. So when one client trying to connect to another server, it knows what is the, the other server name and can ask the KDC, please give me a ticket for that server. The client as well need to be taught how to basically use the thing. So you have to teach the client how to use LDAP for, to get users. You have to tell the client how to use Kerberos to, get, uh, to log you in. And you have to tell the client where is the NTP server and where is the DNS server to use to be able to do both things. Um, this also means that usually you want to connect the DNS and the directory. Um, it might just be that you use uh, host files on the directory in case you don't want to use a DNS server or just that the client use the directory to, to, to store his own name so that DNS can ask the directory to use the directory as a storage. Um, 
but usually you want to connect them so that each host is connected to his own name uh, in the DNS. So when you create a new, a new machine and a new uh, service principle, you also can link these two things together so that the, the name of the machine is linked to the, to the um, service principle of, of, of the server. And that's because, uh, again, when you look at the whole organization tree, you want to see that if, if each server actually has Kerberos connection or not in an easy way. So you want to keep everything in, in one place to connect all the, all, all the dots. Uh, as soon as you start thinking about that, you also realize that you have to have a method to configure the client, at least for the very basic things like where, where do I connect to get information. Partially that can be resolved through DNS and SRV records, so that in DNS you can tell where the directory and where the Kerberos server is. Are, but you also want to provide the client, client with at least the basic security policies it has to use, whether it can accept uh, a connection, uh, authenticator or unauthenticator, whether it can accept the connection for a from a specific user for a specific server and stuff like that. So as soon as you start uh, having the network as your party, you really want to have a method to configure the client as well in a centralized manner. So when you change something in your organization, you don't have to run machine by machine, but you have an automatic distribution of this information to the client. Some information can, get, can be downloaded from, direct, from the directory. Some information still, in, at least in Linux systems, is really embedded in, in, in configuration files. So you need another method to get this information and put that into, into files. That's what we call policies. Another component that we think is important is uh, web UI and admin tools. And the way we build the admin tools and the web UI is through a, a web server, Apache in this case, and an XML RPC interface. So basically, web server becomes a, com a component of this picture because you need to manage the web server, you need to make the web server available to clients. And that means also you probably need a certification authority. Because when you talk to a web server and you want to have uh, a secure channel, usually you need an SSL certificate, a TLS certificate. So immediately you start having the problem that when you have multiple servers and, and clients, you basically need to make sure that the clients connect to the right web servers and not to many in the middle servers that can spoof your connections. And that means you need a certification authority of some sort, or at least certificates from an external certification authority, so that uh, the client can trust the SSL certificate without user integration. And finally, once you have all these pieces, you really need a way to know that everything is running properly, that there are no breaches in the security. So you basically need an auditing system that can connect to all these pieces and report in central location if there's something is, is, is not working correctly or if there is a uh, penetration attempt or whatever. So that each single piece can report in a central place where you can uh, basically collect and compare data from all these systems to know that your uh, solution is working properly. Okay. So, what are the actual components that we decided to use inside FreeIPA? Uh, we, we started with Fedora Directory Server and MIT Kerberos. We added Apache on top with a bunch of modules that we use by default. Uh, modern SES instead of modest SL is used. Uh, in, um, NSS is the uh, Nested Security Services Library, which is a very it's a very good uh, SSL TLS uh, uh, it's a, a library, which is used because it's also certified. It has FIPS 1, FIPS 2 compliance. And uh, it's a library that is being used more and more inside Ferrara. Uh, there is actually a project to push all upstream uh, 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 projects to try and use NSS instead of uh, OpenSSL or other solution like new TLS. Um, we also need more out Kerberos to be able to use Kerberos authentication in, in, in Apache. And we will see why we use Mod Proxy. Um, for the web interface, we use uh, TurboGears. And we also use Python, because TurboGears uh, uh, well, 
to which use Python, but use Python also to implement the XML RPC interfaces. Um, we also uh, had to implement custom Fedora Directory Server plugins, and we developed a set of tools also in Python uh, for the admins. Um, and this is basically the stack you see on the server side in V1. Um, on the client side, we use in V1 NSS, LDAP, and Palm Keras 5 on Linux. Um, more or less, all Unix system has have equivalents, um, and we basically use what uh, what is available on these systems. Uh, what we have as we don't have, and that's in gray, is we don't have a proper CA in V1. What we do in the default installation is to create a sub-signed CA and expose the certificate through the web server. It's not ideal. Um, we don't have policies in V1, and we don't have the audit piece. So the, all the things you saw in the last slide. Basically, the red pieces and the green one are, not, are, are absent. I mean, the green is self-signed, so it's not really there. This is the directory structure we use. Uh, why it is important? Because uh, even though uh, LDAP tend to be very flexible, um, also need to have some conventions so that you can actually use uh, the directory uh, in the same way. Uh, one of the things you can see immediately from here is that you don't see the familiar OU eagle people or OU eagle group. In, in the base DN suffix that uh, you might normally see in other uh, LDAP uh, data implementations. We decided not to go that way, and we decided to basically put all the user and group information under the CN Eagle accounts um, subtree because that way we could uh, more easily uh, add access control instructions only on one subtree and keep other subtrees like CN Kerberos or CN ETC where we put a lot of configuration uh, outside of uh, those, these ICIs and make it simpler basically to um, prevent uh, access to part of the directory where normal clients shouldn't have access. Um, yeah, um, and this came handy immediately uh, after V1.0 was released because um, we found out that unfortunately Solaris does not support in 2009 RFC to 307 bis. Uh, RFC to 307 bis is, is, what, is what we rely on because instead of using the very old member UID attribute where in a group you just name the user by name, we use the member and member of attributes where you basically put the DN of the user into the group entry. And unfortunately, Solar is, is the only one that is not able to read the information that way. So what we, what we did is we built a plugin in FDS that basically create a virtual subtree called CN Eagle Compact. And it basically, it presents the same information you have in CN accounts, CN groups, but with the old RFC 2307 schema. So if you have a legacy client a Solaris client, a very old Linux client, some old AAX or HPX client that still don't support 2307 bis, what, what you can do is basically point these clients to use the Compat subtree to find group information. And they can find group information in the form that they used to. OK. Um, so besides the directory, how did, uh, how did we basically integrate Kerberos in the directory. As, as I said before, one of the problem is synchronization or integration information. We wanted to avoid having a different database for Kerberos because we would have to synchronize that database with the directory. So basically what we did, we create, uh, we used the LDAP plugin of, of the MIT KDC and we store all the uh, Kerberos information into LDAP as well. In, Actually, we store the user credential in the uh, user entry. Uh, and then we just use ACIs to provide, prevent any other user or the user himself to directly access those credentials. Uh, another piece that was necessary, though, is the password plugin. And because we wanted to allow people to also use a classical LDAP bind, 
uh, for legacy applications. Uh, we needed to make sure that the password hash in LDAP was actually uh, representing the same password that you use in Kerberos, so that you can use the, sa the, the, the single password approach in that case. Uh, so basically what we did is reroute IPA KPASVD, creating a new uh, KPASVD daemon specific for IPA that basically rewrote any password change uh, request on the KPASVD protocol to, the, uh, to LDAP and use the LDAP password operation. Uh, the same happens if you use directly LDAP password operation against the LDAP server. You go through the password plugin. The password plugin basically generates all the Kerberos uh, material for Kerberos. When then you do K in it, uh, Kerberos, the KDC basically gets that information out of LDAP, uh, extract from ASN1 uh, the secrets, and is able to authenticate your, your packets and give you back Kerberos TGT. Okay. So basically the directory is the source of all the information. We don't have a synchronization problem because the information is kept within the, all, all the user data. So if a user is deleted, also all his Kerberos material is deleted immediately. The Kerberos server will not be able to give, uh, again, the, uh, a ticket for a user that doesn't exist. We don't need to basically go back into the Kerberos database and try to delete it as well. Uh, when a user is reading the same, et cetera. So <clears throat> the other part is management interfaces. Uh, they, are too, they are also completely depend on the directory server, of course. Um, as, as I told you before, we use three main modules in Apache, and that's because in V1, um, we had a problem with uh, convincing the, the Turbo Gear stack to use Kerberos authentication. So what we did is to create, basically, a proxy approach where the authentication is done by a mode of Kerberos on Apache, and then the, every, every single query is proxy to the, to the GUI, which is a process that runs only locally. And the GUI is, uh, gets actually the Kerberos credentials, uh, even though it's not able to use the, it, them itself to authenticate the user, um, and use uh, the XML RPC interface so that we keep ourselves honest. Everything that you see from web interface is the same thing that's used also from the admin tools so that they all use what one path only. You don't have to duplicate uh, functionality, and you're sure that if you test something with one of the two, it's the, it's the same thing. So uh, if 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 you if you make something new in the in the web UI, basically you have to also create the common line utility at the same time. And we we basically get the credentials into XML RPC, and we use your Kerberos credentials that uh, are delegated to us to connect to directory server, and that's another layer of security. Uh, because basically it means that um, the web server doesn't have any privileged access to the directory. To be able to access any data in the directory, you really need to have your own Kerberos ticket. So when you connect to the to either XML RPC or to the uh, or to the GUI, you have to provide your own user ticket. And that ticket, because it, it, it we use delegation, is what is used to uh, authenticate the XML RPC piece to the directory. So it, it's not possible, it's structurally not possible for someone to basically hijack the, the, the web UI and try to perform administrative uh, tasks unless you really have the, administrated, uh, the administrator ticket. So you really need to be administrator before you're able to do, uh, to do anything like that. And um, yes, so Let's, let's go on because I have only 10 minutes. So this is the, the, the web interface for V1. Just wanted to show something. Uh, it's very simple, very basic. It doesn't do much, but it does the, the task we needed. Uh, add, find users on, on the right. Add, find groups, delete groups. Uh, manage policy, which are just uh, password policies in, in, in V1. Uh, we also have a self-service um, uh, page where a user can change some of his, his own attributes. Again, because we have ACIs, we can allow a user to basically change some of the information that are in directory. For example, you may say, uh, I want to allow the user to change his own phone number. 
so that other users can get an updated phone number without having to go through an administrator to change that information. Uh, but we, don't, we want absolutely to prevent him to change his own group ownerships, for example, stuff like that. Um, we also have, of course, a common line interface. Um, there are a lot of commands uh, around there, more than 20. And if you really, really are not satisfied by using abstractions, you can even go and use LDAP yourself uh, if you know what you're doing. Although I, I don't think you really want to do that. You usually will break your own installation. But as you can see, this seems a very complex system. And we said we want to make it simpler to manage. Yes, the web interface can help, but it's also the whole thing about installation. So. What we, what, we, what we built within the project was actually, for example, a whole set of uh, installed jellies, uh, for both for the server and the client. If you want to try IPA, uh, and I, I suggest you, you try them, uh, and V1.2 especially, uh, all you have to do is basically install the packages, run IPA server install, and you, are, you get three questions. It asks you what is the real name for Kerberos, and it also suggests a default based on your DNS name, the DNS name of the machine. It asks you for a directory manager password, which is kind of the root password of the system, uh, it's something that you don't use for n normally, except for very specific operations. And then it asks you for an admin user password, and the admin user is the default user that is created in the system that has a, a set of privileges, like it can create other users, can create groups, change policy, and stuff like that. Uh, once you do that, basically the job is done. The server is installed, configure all the components, are, are configured in the system, restarted, and basically you have a working IPA server that can immediately serve out tickets to, to the admin user or any user you create with the admin user. So we, we basically tried to make it very, very simple to install. Without all the uh, problems you have, trying to understand how to configure LDAP, how to configure Kerberos, how do I configure any other, other service there. It's really as easy as that. Um, so what would you end up to once you have done that? You have that core that now se seems much simpler. It has all the components we described, but they are contained in that, in that thing. And basically all you have to do is basically install a client. And, and there too, it's not that complex. We have a client install tool that will configure NSSL.pumpkerbos5 and it works on Red Hat and Fedora, not other system at this moment, but it's very simple to configure just NSSL.pumpkerbos compared to what is uh, to, to configure the whole server thing. And you can use basically any any client that supports Kerberos authentication in the browser to connect to the server and do management through Web UI or through the admin tools. Um, the other thing we, we needed to add is multiple servers. As, as we said, one of the problems is uh, a single point of failure. What happens if my server has a hardware failure? If it goes down, the whole organization if, 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 can't work because it, my users cannot authenticate. And that's also uh, one of the reasons we, we choose directory server instead of something like OpenLDAP. Directory server has a very mature multi-master replication. Uh, and it can basically um, replicate all the information at the attribute level on all the servers so that when you change something on any of the servers, that information is replicated uh, immediately to all servers. Uh, also meant that we could avoid using uh, the Kerberos replication uh, server, KProp D, and instead of having one master Kerberos server and many slaves, basically we have multiple master Kerberos servers as well. Um, again, setting up a replica is quite easy. Uh, IPA replica prepare run on the, on, the, on the master generates a file that is uh, encrypted so you can safely transport it over the network. And you just get this file on, on, on a new server, you run IPA replica install, and you'll basically just do it. It will take all the information in that file, generate a new, uh, a new server, install all the components, and start running. And from that point on, you have two servers that are replicating all the information. 
If you, if you add multiple servers, you can also use IPA Replica Manage to change the replication agreements. So if you have four servers, you can uh, use it to add a new replication agreement so you that have uh, a fully matched replication. Uh, we test up to, and by, by test I mean QA, up to four servers. Uh, they can replicate completely, even the other cross there. And you can use DNS records to basically spread the load about, uh, among all clients. So if you DNS service records, you basically can tell the clients, this is the list of KDCs, this is the list of LDAP server, connect to any of them. And they will tend to spread the load around. Um, okay, that was version one. And as I told you, it lacks policy and audit. Uh, so what do we have in version two? Well, in version two, we have also some few interesting things. Uh, the thing I'm working at the moment is SSD, System Security Services Daemon, uh, plus an IPA plugin. Uh, that daemon is basically a client agent that is able to combine Kerberos authentication, LDAP queries, policy queries in one piece, uh, do caching, uh, do offline operations. These are all things you can't do with NSS LDAP or PAM Kerberos, which are very bad thing because uh, uh, if you lose your network uh, temporarily, you can't get any more uh, user information. So uh, application may get stuck when they do a simple thing like get PW name, which asks for information for the user. Um, we, we, we are creating a policy infrastructure where we have a policy process processor on the client, also called by the, uh, by the daemon, and we have also management interfaces for that. We, we, have, we, we are introducing host-based access control, centrally managed and the rules are stored in LDAP, so that you can say user foo can connect to machine bar between 8 and 10, Monday to Friday, nobody else. Or even at the service level, you can say foo can connect to bar through SSH, but not, not to Samba or HTTP, stuff like that. Uh, we are introducing roles in V2, um, but that's a bit complex. Uh, let's go on because I have very little time left. And we also have an audit daemon both on the server and on the client. Um, a new web UI. Uh, as you see, we had to build a kind of hack in V1 where you have a proxy, stuff like that. We tried to solve that. We are also trying to have a better user interface. So we have sessions with people that are expert in UI design to try to make it a bit, a bit better, a uh, bit edgy, with more interactive stuff like that. Although we keep the same code, again, to also provide all the common line stuff. Um, DNS integration, uh, it's another thing. Uh, we are working on a new LDAP bind plugin um, and GSSDC to provide the option to do dynamic updates. Uh, a registration authority, which can connect a certification authority to request certificates and other services on LDAP. So this is the picture of V2. It's not very different from the previous one, but you can see there are a few more things that we ask and a few more pieces in the core. Still, we try to keep it simple from the management point of view. Um, yeah, uh, just one word on client machine identities. What, what we lack in V1 was, by default, having a, an identity for the machine. And that's very important because, because you want to really be able to uh, use uh, Kerberos also from the machine to connect to the server, uh, to get data in an authenticated way. Um, and you want to be able to, by default, connect to another machine using SSH and Kerberos without having to manually create uh, a, a host uh, principle and install it manually in the server. So we, we do that through the, the new client. Um, policies, we discuss them a bit. If, you have, if you're interested, we, I, I have a talk later on in the Fedora session. I will talk about, a bit about this. And audit as well, two pieces. Uh, the, the client that collects audit, uh, audit logs, for the kernel audit logs, uh, syslog as well. You can use our syslog to, uh, to, to, to send them. We will also have an option to use the NQP, which is a very interesting messaging queue protocol. has a very good thing that it can 
uh, do store and forward. So if your, if your machine loses the network, you can store the logs temporarily. When the next one comes back, you can send them. You can also have routing rules, so you can have an audit server that is interesting only on a subset of the logs, and another one that collects all of them just for storage and stuff like that. Um, and in fact, we have a, a server component that gets all the information from the clients, uses Kerberos authentication to connect the client and the server so that you have authentication sign and seal of the connection, you, so you have proof that the, 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 the log comes from the real client and stores them for later retrieval. And I have no time, I wanted to just show this diagram which is the thing I'm working on. Uh, I will talk about this in detail into the Fedora uh, talk section at 4, 4 p.m. if you're interested in, in this component. Um, I guess we don't have time, much time for questions, maybe one. Yep. Windows integration and status version two. Okay, so the question is Windows integration and status version two. Uh, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> The problem with Windows is that uh, they actually assume a lot of things from an authentication, from an authentication, authentication point of view. Um, uh, at the moment, we have a synchronization between FreeIPA users and Active Directory users, if you use Active Directory. Um, there, we, we have on our wiki page is also instructions uh, built by some users, very, very good instructions. If you just want to use uh, the Kerber side of FreeRPA to do authentication. The problem is there is that Windows will never connect to LDAP to get user and group information. So what, 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 what you do in that case is basically you create a local user and you associate that user with Kerberos credentials. So you can get at least your Kerberos credentials if you don't have a lot of interaction, maybe you have just a Windows desktop for some special purpose, then maybe having group and other information is not that important. You can use that method. At least you have centralized authentication against IPA. You can access services through Kerberos. But yeah, it, it, it's kind of limited, and the plan is to work with the Samba community to basically integrate free IPA Samba for at some point. And, but that will take a lot of time this month. Uh, version two under development. Uh, I have a number of pieces of this thing you're seeing here. Um, we initially tried to shot for release. Uh, early this summer, I don't think we will make it. Uh, it, it. It's really a lot of work to add other pieces, but we are confident that we can have uh, at least the very basic pieces working uh, sometime by the summer so we can start testing stuff. In, in the master tree, we now have all the new web UI stuff, the new command line utility stuff that Jason has built, and uh, we have the SSD tree which is going on. Uh, the policy work has started as well. We have some stuff there. We have a basic daemon is being integrated. So yes, we are progressing, but thanks very much. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you.